nothing. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Squat Cobbler, episode 66, where we're back to talking about Alice Cooper. I'm Kelly at K E L L Y T H U L on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Mike at Official Pagan on everything, but I primarily just use Instagram at this point. Now, Kelly, we're back doing Alice Cooper. This is our bread and butter. Before we get started, though, because I know know how much the squaddies love when we take a long time up front big fans of that (laughs) exactly so before we get into it for any of our listeners who don't know kelly recently got back from an extended trip to las vegas kelly just between you me and the squaddies what are some of the shenanigans you got into in vegas minimal shenanigans however i did uh get to ride in a a mclaren are you familiar with a car called a mclaren no not a car guy me either (laughs) i didn't know how to open the door to it it's one of those ones that kind of swing up weird ways and all that drove around uh red rock and hoover dam as a passenger in a mclaren so that's about as wild as it got minimal activity ate a lot of good food though hey that's always good are you a sushi guy because i'm gonna take as long as i can up front now <laughs> <laughs> i i am a sushi guy <laughs> so it feels weird to say but are you a sushi guy mike i am love sushi love sushi um so i used to be a banker for anyone who doesn't know <laughs> People are going to be so mad. We're going to be going like, over Mike's job career, here, his yeah. history. This is basically just a podcast resume right now that I'm putting out there. Uh, so I used to be a banker and my office, I didn't work at a branch. I was back office. I was a fraud investigator. And my office was in Philadelphia in China, right next to Chinatown. So I used to be able to get, I never had sushi before. And as soon as I tried sushi, I immediately fell in love with it. And I also learned the hard way, the difference between like properly prepared fresh sushi and like mall sushi. I learned that really quickly too, because, you know, getting great, awesome, fresh sushi from Chinatown versus getting it prepackaged from like, you know, the 7-Eleven in the mall. Not exactly the same thing, but huge sushi fan in general. So mall sushi is a great band name. Absolutely a great band name. Oh yeah, that is. Speaking of sushi, which is made of fish, which are in the ocean, which France is by where Paris is in. We're here to talk about Alice Cooper's new live album. <laughs> Alice Cooper, Paranormal Evening at the Olympia Paris. So I I have stuff about Paris, but before we get into that, we should probably talk about the album cover, right? Indeed, we just want to talk about Paris in general. Uh, Let's let's (laughs) slide into the album a little bit for a while. Let's see how that works. All right. You're the Sherpa, so. Yep. For the first set, because this is a lengthy album, 18 tracks in total. So Mike and I are going to split Sherpa duties, and I'll take us through the first nine, and then Mike will bring us home on the last uh, last nine. Yeah, it's a Uh, double album. Is this Alice's first live double album? I'm going to say yes. Because I'm thinking back, we did do a live album show where we discussed all of the albums, mostly Fistful of Alice. Uh, but we we touched on all of them. I, I believe this is the first one that's a double album, though. I believe you're correct. And, of course, the specter of Fistful of Alice will hang over this because it is the gold standard for both Mike and I in terms of live Alice Cooper. Honestly, it's, for me, one of the gold standards of live albums in general. And I, something that you and I have talked about is possibly doing an episode about some of our favorite live albums. Which we should we should absolutely do. The good news is, is before... Before we do that, which we need to get lined up, we and we appreciate it. We've got one of the squaddies, Mick, has asked that Mike and I review Battle Axe by the uh, original Alice Cooper group, the, who reformed as Billion Dollar Babies sans Alice. That'll be fun. So we'll, we'll get that rotated in there. We definitely got to do the live album one as well. But much like we will likely compare and contrast. Well, before we get into that, though, I have a question for Mick. What would you like me to talk about to kill a ton of time in the beginning of that episode? <laughs> yeah, Mick, if you want to kind of throw a comment in there and let us know what totally unrelated information you'd like Mike to dwell on, I'm, I'm sure he'll be able to come up with something without help, but maybe you can steer him a little bit. The album cover is not as good. It's a good album cover. I like it. It's Alice kind of prepping before the evening, uh, getting ready, getting the eye makeup on. Fistful of Alice, better cover. <laughs> so this is a nice cover. I like it. I didn't mind the image itself. Like, it's it's a well done it's a well shot image uh the black and white alice getting ready in the mirror my problem is what i like about alice what i love about alice is that i feel like he's always raised the bar or set new standards for what he does when i don't like things sometimes that alice does is whenever i feel like he's following which is very rare but this is an image that we've seen a million times that over the shoulder shot of the reflection in the mirror of the artist getting ready. Dozens of album covers, singles, promo shots from a wide array of artists. In fact, 
right around the same time this was released, there was a Prince album released called, uh, I believe it's called a piano and a microphone. And it's an album of uh, unreleased songs from the eighties that his estate recently released. It is identical image <laughs> on the cover. It's, it's so overused and I got to get a Prince reference in right away. There you go. It's, <laughs> it's such an overused image and that's my problem with it. It's not that it's, it's poorly done here. The presentation of it's fine. I've just seen this a million times before. I actually like groaned when I saw it. There is a different image on the vinyl though. Yeah. And I think the, it's, and I think it's the kind of secondary image as, as a double album goes, it's the secondary image on a more of an LP fold out. The, the other one's probably a little bit better. This full of Alice was better. <laughs> so. This full of Alice was definitely better. So unfortunately, this is to me one of the weaker Alice Cooper album covers. It goes up against quite a few really, really strong efforts. This one's very serviceable. Nothing wrong with it. It's certainly not a raise your fist and yell issue. But uh, right, yeah, I don't, I don't actively dislike it. It's just this is like I said before. You know, Alice sets a certain standard for me, and I know for you as well because as the Squatties know, we're huge fans. And this is just something that doesn't live up to the great album covers we've gotten from Alice in the past. Yeah. So going into the album, you know, we've already, already well established where we're at. I know, I know it's a little come, <laughs> kind of rushing it. <laughs> Slow <but>. down. <laughs> Hold on there, big boy. When I looked at the track listing, I said, huh, this one might have a shot at giving Pistol of Alice a run for their money because it's got a couple of interesting uh, additions we haven't. I don't think I've ever been on a live album. Uh, the World Needs Guts, which uh, we'll talk more about in a little bit. And this is the first appearance of anything off a of Paranoic Personality, the title track from that. good. It was a really solid. It has both a Halo of Flies and Woman of Mass Distraction, which are two kind of really heavy, cool live ones. So great lineup. Pain's another one that's not typically, we don't see a whole lot of. So pretty cool in terms of the mix. So going in, when you saw the track listing, were you excited? So when I saw the album title, and I know it's the the title of the tour, but whenever I see like the evening with thing, to me, that denotes we're going to see a longer set. You're going to see some deep cuts in there, maybe some B-sides or something you wouldn't expect. So that's what I was hoping for. And obviously that's what we got with Pain, The World Needs Guts and things like that. So I was excited to see that, that it wasn't just a live hits record that we're getting something a little bit different. One thing that did throw me on the track list, though, I mean, Paranormal's in the name. We're not getting a lot of Paranormal on this, though. I would have hoped for at least two tracks off of it because we were, as when we did the review, we talked about how good these would sound live. I was really hoping, especially with a double album, that we would have gotten more of the Paranormal album live because not only, as you said, did we talk about how great these tracks would perform live, I would love to hear them with Alice's live band. Not that the studio recordings weren't great and the guest musicians were excellent. I really wanted to hear some of those tracks with this band, though. So it kicks off with Brutal Planet and the intro. I know (laughs) you keep going back to talk about the album. Funny about that. And so it's a riff off of you get uh, the way Brutal Planet, Brutally Live, uh, opened up. The controller came out and welcomed people to Brutal Planet. And this is kind of a riff off of that. You get that same kind of, you know, welcome brave strangers kind of thing going on, foreboding that you're now going to be trapped uh, dealing with Alice Cooper crowds getting whipped into a frenzy as much as people in Paris get whipped into a frenzy. Kelly hates the French. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and it roars right into brutal. <laughs> no denial. You don't repeat negative language, Mike. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to not repeat negative language. I love the French, though. I just want to say that. So it balances out. Kelly hates you guys. I love you guys. Listen to as much Alice Cooper and as much of my music as you possibly can. Actually, I wore I warmed to the French uh, as this album went on, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about the moment that they they won my heart. I think uh, I know what it is because I have a note about it. <laughs> but they were, roared right into Brutal Planet. The band this is, as Mike mentioned, we're excited to hear his his regular band on anything from Par- Paranoia uh, and as, as well Paranoic Personality. But um, they're always going to be solid. Nina Strauss, geez, she kills it. She is just amazing. But we get the roar of Brutal Planet, very good execution of it. Equally as good as on Brutally Live, if not better. Great start to the album. Always a good way to kick a set list off, too. So I, and I should have, in in preparing for this, I did not look up the track list from the actual night that this was recorded from. 
So I'm not sure if this is the entire show or if anything was cut for the album. What are your thoughts, though, on when you go into a live environment, while it's Alice or anybody else, what are your thoughts on intros? And what are your thoughts on including the intro on the live recording? Depends on the execution. I think the intros for Alice Cooper shows are often a highlight, one of the highlights of the show and uh, really kind of sets things off, ready to go. So when it's an Alice one, I always welcome it. Some other ones, maybe not so much, but even on like Waiting for Columbus, uh, My Little Feet, you get the little kind of intro piece of there and it's kind of fun. So I think it's kind of a nice way to ease into the to the live album. So I don't mind it. It can, as long as it's executed well. Yeah, I, I don't mind it being included, especially if you get an, a live album that is sourced from a single show. And that's something I'm not sure if we've actually talked about this or not. Do you have a preference when you're listening to a live recording if it's sourced from a single show or from multiple shows? I probably lean towards single show over multiple shows just because you, there's a, a continuity that an energy that kind of runs across a show that is kind of nice to have as part of the listening to a live album experience. Peter Gabriel plays live uh, is sourced from multiple shows, one of which I was at uh, in terms of the actual recording of it. That's a really good live album. And so, but overall, if I have a choice, I'd rather have it sourced from a single show. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a single show guy now. I think early on, it I didn't really care either way. I just looked at it as, well, these are the best performances from the tour. Now, though, I can appreciate a single show because I feel, and this is in keeping with my thoughts on this track, Hearing the intro with it and knowing that it was sourced from a single show gives you more of an actual feel of being there at that performance that I don't necessarily think you get from something that was sourced from multiple shows. Now, what I mentioned about the track listing, though, not looking that up, just to make another correlation to a band that Alice Cooper has performed with a number of times. So Guns N' Roses has has released two double live albums. The first was a contractual obligation album that was sourced from multiple shows. Not a huge fan of it. And the next one they did, I'm a huge fan of and will definitely appear on my my live albums list, was sourced from a single show. Now that was released on CD as well as a DVD and Blu-ray. The DVD and bl- the CD version of it is trimmed down to fit on a two discs because it was a two and a half hour performance, which wouldn't fit on a two CD. So there's a few songs trimmed off of that. So that's why I should have beforehand looked up the track list to this to see if this was pared down in any way to fit onto the double album. It's a 90 minute set. So it's not like, you know, you're not getting a ton of material here, but I am just curious um, if anything was maybe cut from this either for time or it just wasn't a stronger performance. And how, how would you feel if that is the case? Would you rather not get an intro or something like that and get an extra song to fit onto a double album for this album? And my hunch is there wasn't anything cut because Alice is pretty predictable about you're getting a 90 minute show. That's what he does. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm years. guessing there wasn't anything cut because you could have gone a little bit longer and still fit on the two CDs. So I like the intro to Brutal Planet. I wouldn't want I w- the album's better for it. So I wouldn't want to give it up for something else. I really enjoyed the intro. I like that this was sourced from a single show. One of the things about this track that I really liked is I love the transition from the intro right into the song. I think it really does give you sort of that live energy that you wouldn't have gotten if it just kicked off with the song. Yeah, and it really gives you a flavor of uh, the seeing Alice live experience because it's just it it's you feel the energy, you feel it just kind of flip right into it, and they they don't mess around; they get right to it. And the backing vocals on this track, I thought, were great. Yeah, I think so. It's not that Alice's performance is bad on this album, but this comes back to once again, Fistful of Alice. I think the recording quality of fistful of alice and i think alice was in just slightly stronger voice for fistful of alice and and live at montrose as well than this album it's not like it's his voice is blown out but i've seen him a number of times and there are a couple times if you catch him a little bit later in the tour you know alice is not a crooner it's going to be kind of a snarl but you can kind of feel like ah this throat's been a little little raw (laughs) it's been going through so you, you get you get just a hint of that not much the backing vocals are super solid alice is still awesome uh, he's just been in my, in my opinion even better on a couple of the other live albums yeah i know what you're talking about and it's not as kelly said just to reinforce it it's not that he doesn't sound great on the album but i believe he mentions in i didn't again should have done a little bit more research on that but i believe he mentions in one of the little things to the audience that this was the final show of that tour which which i think you just hear a hint of in the delivery yeah. 
Yeah, you can hear that there's a little bit of wear and tear, that this is the end of a tour kind of show. On the reverse side of that, the band is probably that much better. Yep, super, super solid. We roll then into No More Mr. Nice Guy, which is, I guess, becoming the generation lance and the generation landslide of of next generation to hell so that we're going to we're going to get no more Mr. Nice Guy on every live album from here on out which is fine very good execution of it it's a fun song well executed i don't have a lot to say about this it was it, it was solid you got what you expect with no more Mr. Nice Guy you get a little bit of the crowd singing along too which is cool and it was kind of mic'd okay for that uh, so i enjoyed it I'm going to take my time with this because I feel like Kelly's trying to rush us through this thing for no good reason. 18 songs. Mike. <laughs> I agree with everything Kelly said. I, I don't think there's, it's a solid performance. I don't think there's a lot to add about it. My only th- quibble, I guess, and this is again, goes back to maybe I should have looked up the track listing. It could have been this way in the performance, but I almost feel like this shouldn't have been the second song. It doesn't feel like the right song to come after brutal planet. No. And it, particularly in between Brutal Planet and Under My Wheels, it just doesn't feel quite sequenced, right? There's nothing wrong with the performance. There's nothing wrong with the recording of it. Sequencing-wise, it just felt a little bit off to me. Yeah, you you put in uh, World Needs Guts or Woman of Mass Destruction uh, after Brutal Planet. That had been a, probably a better flow because you then get nothing wrong with No More Mr. Nice Guy, but Brutal Planet tears it up and then you get into a long time classic under my wheels always a tremendous song live some great guitar on this from the crew as good as about any of his performances of under my wheels really enjoyed really enjoyed it yeah great performance i i feel like this should have been the second song or maybe something else moved to the second song again minor quibble wasn't under my wheels something that was mentioned by our favorite <laughs> commenter yeah <laughs> i think it was it was uh, yes i can't <laughs> <laughs> um, even if I could recall all the verbiage, I probably wouldn't be super excited to share it. But yes, he did. He did quote at least some of the verbs in under my wheels in a lyric in one of his his quotes. Because yeah, I think two of his comments had a, a callback to under my wheels. Oh well, now I need to go back. I can only remember the one. All right, let's in real time go and check. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna let Mike research. I'm fairly my memory could be wrong here. But I, th- I think there was actually, I think there are actually two references, something about the telephone and then another one, but I, the I telephone is the one that I remember. Yeah. I remember but the telephone. We won't do that now since Kelly's in such a rush to get through this thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We can, we can maybe include it in the blog post. So next comes up department of you. When we talked about live albums, I talked about this full of Alice sits at the top. There's a lot I like about live at Montrose. The department of youth kicks off that live album. And uh, it roars into a tremendously great start. This is another very good execution of Department of Youth, but I I put the Live at Montrose version ahead of it. Really, really solid. I'm really surprised because this song on Welcome to My Nightmare, it's it's solid and it's good, but you just didn't anticipate that it could be kind of as as tough uh, as it could be live or as, as kind of rough. But they really they really knock it out of the park. It's just a, a good rocking song, and. Alice always looking to stay contemporary back in the day, 19 in 1975, when welcome to my nightmare came out at the very end of department of youth, where he's talking about, we've got the power and Alice is singing who gave it to you. And on the 1985 version, 1975 version, the kids respond, Donnie Osmond. So Donnie's been dropped at this point in time and has been replaced by Justin Bieber. So we get, what I believe is the first mention of Justin Bieber on any of Alice Cooper's recorded works. Actually, my main note for this track is it's probably time to update the Justin Bieber reference. So who would you go with? I'm not sure. I was going to ask you that. Uh, I'm going to have to get back to you. (laughs) (laughs) Justin Bieber, I I think is, is a little past that, that point. Yeah. I don't know what the kids today listen to. I don't know. Nothing against Justin Bieber. I actually think he's very talented. I'm I'm that believe it or not is not a knock on Justin Bieber. I, ju- I just think that, you know, he's past, he's a grown married man now. I think he's past that, the kids listening to thing. Well, for me, Justin Bieber is the French of singers. <laughs> so well, He is Canadian, so maybe that's what it is. Yeah, French Canadian, probably French Canadian. <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you he's French Canadian. Remember, Kelly hates you French people. It's terrible. Just just for is a few more songs. You, and then you win me over, and I, you have my undying respect, but... <laughs> At this point of referencing Bieber, I'm like, ah, he's French Canadian. I'm pretty sure it's racist. Kelly's racist against yeah. French people. I've, I've, I've turned I've turned over a new leaf. We'll get to we'll get to it shortly. <laughs> uh, then we move into pain. Kind of cool because you don't get 
pain on too many live albums very often. It's a another song, kind of like Department of Youth, that you go, how much teeth is this going to have as a live song? It does really well. Uh, it's a really faithful execution. Again, great guitar work. It's super fun to listen to. I had hoped, and uh, another another one of the squaddies had, when we reviewed Plush the Fashion, talked about how much we like this song, but kind of pointed out there's all this darkness about all the different pain and all the examples Alice is giving about, you know, the filthiest word on the, the vandalized grave and et cetera like that. But then amongst all of those things, there was the lump on your head when you step on a rake, which it just didn't feel so the same kind and quality as the other pain being offered. Correct. And one of our listeners pointed out that they, he, Alice did actually revise the lyrics um, for some of the live shows that involved bodies in a lake, which is awesome. <laughs> and I think I was kind of hoping that that would have been the drop on this one, but he, it's still the lump on the head when you step on the rake. But I think the bodies on the lake angle, good angle. And I think that should be a permanent change to pain. Yeah, that sounds way better. More consistent. Yeah, I wish we had gotten that because, again, even re-listening to it, that line, I was like, ah, that's where the song loses me a little bit. But it was really cool to hear more of a deep cut kind of song like that. Probably, so, if if they had contacted us and were like, what flush the fashion track would you want to hear on here? I would not have chose Pain, but I think this is an excellent execution of the song. What would you have chosen? See how flush the fashion? Probably Clones. Clones is fun live. Could go with that. Could go with that. That's and it's just one of my favorite Alice songs. That's the one that when I think flush the fashion, that's the song that immediately pops into my head. That'd be good. I think um, uh, leather boots might be kind of fun too. But, uh, oh yeah, I could see that. So uh, so then then Alice goes to kind of a arcane. Probably most of you are not familiar with a little tune called Billion Dollar Babies. Glenn Sobel, the drummer, one of the most iconic kind of drum riffs to begin a song. Uh, the Billion Dollar Babies start and. Uh, he nails that. It is a very faithful, great execution of Billion Dollar Babies, much like the Under My Wheels a little bit earlier. So you're seeing Alice Live. This is something you want to hear uh, and uh, really good. It, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Great execution of the song. Great, you know, punch with the live, especially uh, as Kelly mentioned, when the drums come in. To me, that's if that hits just perfectly the way it's supposed to, you know, it's going to be a great performance of the song. It's just that thing that hooks you right away. One of the things that popped in my head listening to this, and maybe you would know better, is there a live recording, like a good live recording of Alice doing this song with Donovan anywhere? I do not believe, and the legions of squatties out there will correct us if we're wrong, I do not believe Donovan ever took the stage with Alice to perform this. I think this was this was all a thing of them both being in Connecticut at the same point in time. He was able to pull him into the recording studio to to join but i i do not believe donovan has ever joined him on stage It'll that's be kind unfortunate of cool. this is this is a great performance but as i was listening to it i was like i wonder if there's a recording of him doing it with donovan live it would be cool for him to bring on guest singers to join him in the future that'd be kind of cool because i don't know is donovan dead or not i believe he is yeah so donovan prob- is probably listening to this <laughs> yeah, he's i'm not dead I'm not- <laughs> you sons of bitches <laughs> So, but in you know whatever accent he has yeah i i, I think he's french so um, uh so then we move into so spoiler gang i really enjoyed this album i think this is a really good live alice cooper album and i highly recommend you getting it but it is having to stack up against some amazing uh work on other live albums by alice uh particularly fistful of alice and while the set list i was like this is a contender there weren't Too many songs so far where I was like, well, this is the best version of that I've heard on anything recorded live by Alice. Until we get to this song. Now, this one doesn't have anywhere else, but they really elevate The World Needs Guts. I've always really liked The World Needs Guts. I think it's a really fun song. Uh, It takes a whole nother dimension live. And to me, this is the jeweled prostate of the album, (laughs) is The World Needs Guts. Uh, (laughs) It is just... um, just amazing uh, i really i love the song i love them amping it up live and alice just sings the heck out of it and it, this is a powerful song i really really enjoyed this song yeah i really enjoyed this as well it's a, i've always thought it was a fun song so it was cool to hear it live there's definitely more punch to it live this song did you ever notice that sometimes with older songs phrasing of certain things doesn't necessarily age well yeah, there's a little bit of that in this song. 
Okay, I was wondering if you were going to catch on to what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, I think I... So we have talked in the past about how gifted Alice is as a lyricist and how clever he can be and do, to do some kind of really amazing things. That's not really on a lot of display on the world he's got. <laughs> it's a, no, yeah. uh, but it's forgivable because it's, it's Alice going, rah, you know, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there, there are some kind of almost cringeworthy lyrics in there, but they're delivered so awesomely I can get by it. And it's something where I'm sure at the time, it, th- this is a situation where j- just the phrasing hasn't changed well with the times. That's all. I'm sure at the time when the song was new, that wasn't necessarily a concern. Yeah, but this is, I mean, and really of everything here, this is probably the one that you, you pick up a little bit of that dating uh, a little bit. Because most of the Al stuff just kind of is timeless, but there is a few yeah. few little things on there. But it's just, it's it's just such a joy to listen to. I, oh yeah, it's still a I fun song. It doesn't take anything away from it. It was just in the context of it being a recent performance. I was like, oh, that's a little weird. But as Kelly said, I, I think I can speak for both Kelly and I. Although Kelly's a racist who hates French people, and I am not, I think I can speak for both of us when we say that Alice is clearly one of our favorite lyricists. So this is not a knock on him as a lyricist. He's he's a favorite of ours. We think he's incredibly clever. We love his music. Every so every once in a while, when there is something like you know the rake thing in pain, what makes that stuff stand out for me so much is just because all of his other lyrics I, have set such a high bar. So the the benefit of the fact that we record these with Google Hangouts, I pull the audio down, I get it edited to add to the podcast and go out. Up here replacing every every time Mike's called me a racist with thoughtful man, <laughs> and so <laughs> but you need to leave that explanation in. <laughs> or or not <laughs> or not we'll see how it goes just for the run time yeah or we may have to pull, we may have to tap into cobbler ren see if he's available to do, give us give us a do me a solid here we'll see what we can do i've i've used no bad language oh. i didn't even use the dated part of world needs guts to make that joke <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but it's uh, i still may prevail upon him we'll see we'll see how it goes <laughs> Well, in that case, <laughs> <laughs> since you're going to already be editing it, yeah, I have plan on it. I usually do. Uh, so we move into track number eight, Woman of Mass Destruction. Uh, Woman of Mass Distraction, which is actually on the set list I have in front of me listed as Woman of Mass Destruction. And so, we're looking at the same set list, so that's the same thing I say. Way to go, Google. Thanks a lot. Woman of Mass Distraction. Love the song on the studio album. It was on Live on Montrose. It was an amazing version on Live of Montrose. Really elevated the song significantly. So I was really excited to see if that was going to be repeated. Um, and I think this one, likely, it's more the the fault of the miking and the recording of it a little bit. Uh, it, it just some of the punch of this live just doesn't appro- hit the same level that it does on Live of Montrose. Still, a re- I mean, it's a great song. This is a fantastic song live. It's just super enjoyable to listen to. But I think there's been a better version done live. Yeah, I agree with Kelly. There, There's a better version of this song. Although, again, great performance of it. And I think the live, I always like this song, but the live version does certainly elevate it. Yeah, it really, it really does. So I will be handing over Sherpa duties uh, after this next song, uh, track nine, which is Poison. This full of Alice version was a lot better. <laughs> this is a good execution. Uh, again, the background vocals are strong, but they're not pulled up as clear. And as sharp as they are in Fistful of Alice, their lead in an intro to it was pretty, pretty sweet. It's a, a good, another good execution. It's just another one that I go, hey, there's been a version of this that was slightly better. Well, significantly better for Fistful of Alice. This is good. Absolutely. You've got um, everybody's doing a great job on it. But uh, I've, I've heard other I've heard other live versions that were better. But it's hard to I don't know what's ever going to top the Fistful of Alice version of Poison because that's just perfect so poison as we discussed when we did our trash review and it, it's kind of tough to talk about trash because it's an album that i didn't love i know kelly isn't you know is kind of in the same boat i think we kind of placed it around the same spot on our rankings there's good stuff on there but it's too sanitized too overproduced and i believe when we were talking about it uh we described it as more of a bob ezra album that features alice's vocals so poison was never a song that i was particularly into uh, I remember hearing it and just not being crazy about it, not really being crazy about the trash album as a whole. 
And then when I got Fistful of Alice, I had a completely new appreciation for that song. The version on Fistful of Alice is excellent. Without the over-sanitized production, you really get the feel of the song, the punch of the song that you don't get on the studio version. I would say the problem is the Fistful of Alice version, as Kelly mentioned, is so good that other recordings of it I've heard have not come close to living up to that. This is a great performance of it. It's just not going to top Fistful of Alice. And you said a, a Bob Ezrin album, but I don't think it was Bob Ezrin we were pointing to for, for Trash. What was that? Oh, I'm sorry. Desmond Child. Yeah. This one child. My fault. I'm sorry, Squatties. Re- just remember Kelly's a racist. That should be your takeaway. Not that I mixed up Bob Ezra and Desmond Child. Things are gonna change, folks. Things are gonna change soon. <laughs> racist coming. Kelly tool. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Turns over a new leaf. So, so I just like to p- apologize in advance because I'm handing over Sherpa duties to Mike at this point in time. So this may end up being a four hour show and we're gonna <laughs> be talking about woodworking and a few other things, but With that, we'll uh, head it over to Mike. You can take it from track 10 to the end. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Squat Cobbler review of Paranormal Evening with Alice Cooper. Before we get into the back half of this album, let's talk for a little bit. (laughs) No, I'm not going to do that. We're going to keep things rolling. Halo of Flies. Yeah, yeah, we've been because we've been rocketing through this. (laughs) Yeah. Kelly, I I can't promise you I'm going to deliver the same breakneck speed that Kelly's been (laughs) going at, but... I'll do my best. Halo of Flies is a favorite of mine. I know it's one of Kelly's favorites as well. I love this song. There's not a lot I can say about the song. It's extended on this, I believe. Am I correct in that? So Halo of Flies is never short, <laughs> you know, in terms of it. Well, I mean, compared to the uh, studio version. Yeah, the uh, the kind of drum bass break um, towards the, the last third is elongated here. So which is, as Kelly mentioned, you know, typical of the live performance, but worth noting for, for any of the squatties who haven't heard a live recording of this or seen it performed live. Excellent performance of it. Not a whole lot more I could say about it. You Kelly. So for those of you deeply familiar with the Alice Cooper reviews that Mike and I have done, Halo of Flies is my favorite Alice Cooper song and it's great live. It's fantastic live. This is a very, this is a very good version of it. Um, I will like a couple of the other ones here, like Poison and a few others, I think there have been better live recordings of it than this one. Mostly because in that drum bass section, a lot of times they kind of cut Chuck Garrick loose and he and Chuck can really own a stage and he'll get out there with the bass and he'll be going for a while and he's kind of basically pulling the crowd into some chants and some different kinds of things going on that really add a tremendous amount of punch uh, to it. And this had... It featured the the sinewy bass of that section and some great drum work by Glenn again. So it was all all really good there. It was a very very good execution of a song that I love. I have I have heard a live version I like better, and then I have personally seen my favorite version ever, which was right around Brutal Planet, just before Brutal Planet, where during the drum part, not only did you have the drummer doing the the stuff. But the two of the guitars, which I think at that point were um, Eric Dover and Ryan Roxy, got up and set drums up on either side of the drum kit, and they all just beat the hell out of the drums during the section. It was amazing. But still fun, uh, great song, and very well executed. Now, what are your thoughts? Because there's going to be a little bit more of this talk, I believe, coming up. But what are your thoughts in general on extended versions of songs live? It depends on what the extension is. So what we get on this one is we're going to get some extensions where they turn Nina Strauss loose on the guitar and I can listen to her play guitar all night long. She's super awesome. I can listen to Glenn Sobel play the drums, Chuck on bass. So when it doesn't become indulgent, uh, I like it. Uh, as long as whoever you've kind of given the, the spotlight to for that period of time makes good use of it and, and really entertains you. And Alice has got a crew of people with them who can rock that. And so I don't mind it unless it gets into one of these kind of more self-indulgent kind of things. What's your point of view? I understand the purpose of it usually, to whether it's to give the singer a break, make some moves around the stage, different things like that. So I get the the logistical angle of it, but if it's being used well, I think it can be a highlight of a show. So a good example that I'll use is uh, <clears throat> if you've ever seen Black Sabbath perform live, Uh, particularly when they perform with Dio, they would do their signature song with him, Heaven and Hell. And 
on their final tours with him before he passed away. This song, <clears throat> that was one that was always a little longer live, and that became a good one, an easy one for them to extend. I believe if you check out some of the live recordings from their final tour with him before he passed away, that song was starting to get close to the 20 minute mark around the end of that. But excellent, particularly guitar solo work in there and some audience interaction stuff so to me and i saw them on that tour and i believe it was clocking about 15 16 minutes at the point i saw them which was earlier in the tour by the end of the tour which there was a live album from i want to say it was like 18 minutes 19 minutes so it, it got even longer but even seeing it at 15 16 minutes i at no point did i feel like it was overextended or overindulgent so I just like you said, if the time is being used properly, I think it can be a highlight of a show. And it adds a uniqueness to the because you're particularly, you know, we're very familiar with all of these songs, we've heard lots of different versions. So when you can add a little bit of a twist, kind of cool. So I guess we need to move on to the next song because Kelly's in a big rush. So Squatties, in the comments, please, please help Mike understand that I'm doing this for you. <laughs> and so. <laughs> So the next song is Feed My Frankenstein. So I'm going to do something that we've already said a number of times. This is a great performance of this song. I love this song. It doesn't compare to the Fistful of Alice version. And particularly on Fistful of Alice, he does the song with Rob Zombie, which adds something extra to it, in my opinion, makes it a unique, a particularly unique performance of an already great song. What are your thoughts, Kelly? Uh, can anything else next? Oh, <laughs> um, the... Uh... <laughs> No, I I'm in complete agreement. Uh, this is this is a great uh, a great performance of the song. The version on Fistful of Alice, you know, throw Rob Zombie in there. It's going to be pretty good. It's going to be, but this is fun. And this has the same problem we talked about on the live tracks that were included uh, on uh, Paranoid Personality uh, as bon- as bonus content. Uh, is there's there's a lot of stage art, stage action going on during Feed My Frankenstein, where the big 15 foot tall Alice zombie thing kind of walks out and that all happens here. You hear the crowd reaction and some things going on. And if you don't have the context to kind of know what's going on, it could be a little confusing. It's a great song. This is a song I've always liked so much better live than off the studio track. And this is another very good live performance of it, but I'm with you. The, the fistful of Alice version is better. Okay. And you know, keeping moving along since Kelly was a little long winded there. Our next song is cold Ethel. So in the process of, of what we've done here of reviewing all of the Alice Cooper albums, I always liked cold Ethel. It really became one of my favorite songs though. In doing that, like it, it elevated so much. I believe I put it on my list of my, my Alice Cooper playlist and in particular, I especially loved, I, I bought the DVD of the Welcome to My Nightmare TV special with Vincent Price. And there's sort of a, a proto music video for this in there that added even more to it. So through the process of doing this, Cold Ethel went from a song I always liked to upper echelon, up top tier Alice Cooper for me. It probably more so than any song that this really moved so far up for me so i was excited to see it on here and i think it's a solid performance of it i loved cold ethel on welcome to my nightmare i mean just in terms of how it kind of fit into the whole ethos of welcome to my nightmare I just thought it was a really cool song live it typically gets better this is another one along with the world needs guts and i think this this is possibly the best live version of cold ethel uh, that i've i've heard the cowbell is powerful and pronounced <laughs> and i don't know how many other cowbell songs alice has but it's heavy it's heavy in cold ethel and well represented on this version of it uh the guitar work on this is great really a ton of punch to it you know because this is a pretty regular occurrence on, on alice live performances i had become you know, it's almost, I wouldn't call it stale, but I, I kind of knew what I was going to get with Cold Ethel most of the time. This version just had a little extra juice to it, so I really, really enjoyed it. Excellent. And have you seen that music video-esque clip from the TV special for it? No, and you had, you know, you have mentioned in the past the the, the collection you got on that, and I've just not pulled the trigger to get it. I really need to because it sounds like it's got a ton of content I'm going to really Oh yeah, and it was it was relatively cheap. I want to say I got it for like eleven or twelve dollars on Amazon, and it has the TV special and a concert film from that era. So um, just just to drag things out, because that's you know that's what I do on on these shows. 
Yeah, um, definitely is. Yeah, sorry about that. You, I think I have hinted at this a little bit in the past. One, I've seen Alice alive a lot. Uh, and many of the times when I've seen Alice, my daughters have joined me as well. It was recently shared with me that they're not cold Ethel fans. Uh, in terms really? of they love Alice. And they're like, yeah, you know, when that comes on, I'm kind of like next. And so as a father, <laughs> you know. I, I I struggle because I want them to love every Alice song, but if their song about sex with a corpse is not their favorite, I, I think that's okay. <laughs> so Yeah, it's tough because my initial knee-jerk reaction was like, do you still love your kids? But then, not as much. Not as yeah. much. <laughs> but then thinking about it, like, well, how excited do you want them to be about necrophilia? But then I come back around again because as we've discussed before, Two of my favorite song topics are necrophilia and having sex while on meth. I haven't actually done either of those in real life. So maybe that's why they, their favorite song topics of mine, just so I can vicariously live through the storyteller. It's your dream date. Uh, necrophilia with a meth addict. (laughs) Is that where we got to go? Oh yeah. Maybe you're on meth having sex with a corpse. Yeah. Not you personally. Like it wasn't, my fantasy is not Kelly having sex on meth, having sex with a corpse, but just, you know, you as in, in me, the royal you. I, um, I, I kind of appreciate, <laughs> I really do kind of appreciate that clarification. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but if anybody else wants to think about Kelly getting loaded up on meth and having sex with a corpse, you're free to do that. We can't stop you. <laughs> in fact, Kelly would probably prefer that that's what you think about. What's the 13th song on this album, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> you just want to keep moving? Yes. Yes, I do. Just blinding speed on this thing. All right. So that brings us to Only Women Bleed. I'm not going to say a lot about this because I have a suspicion Kelly's got something to say about this. Kelly? So actually a fumble on my part. I think the whole part of Kelly and meth and stuff <laughs> kind of threw me because I believe the, the moment actually occurs in terms of the way the tracks work. It's at the end of Cold Ethel. Uh, that this actually occurs uh, before Only Women Bleed begins. Oh, and okay. this is when, while I will not agree with Mike's depiction <laughs> of of me of earlier in the podcast. Having sex with a corpse or being a racist? Which one? The, the, if, if, so if, if, I, if I had allegedly an issue with French people, <laughs> it went away at the end of Cold Ethel. Because, so I'm a little confused because where this is happening in the set list, this isn't, they haven't gone off to come on and play an encore because we we still have six more songs to go. Right. We but, do get this again. But there is but a chant begins to that strikes you as it's that encore chant. It's one in, and so the crowd is chanting Alice, which is what Alice Cooper crowds do when they want Alice to come back out. However, there's nothing more magical <laughs> than hearing thousands of French people. <laughs> going Alice, Alice, Alice it is just amazing. Uh, it, it was just a wonderful, but to me, the actually the highlight of the album uh, is that chant <laughs> to pull him back out. So I've been one over and uh, so there'll be no other talk, Mike, of Kelly's position no, because the French are wonderful people. See that you guys now have the ringing endorsement of a man who gets loaded up on meth and has sex with corpses. And also came up with a little rhyme about Jesus kissing his thighs. That wasn't my, well, I guess I did. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. You mentioned it. That is a fact. <laughs> yes, I did. Sorry. <laughs> That'd be a good ringtone. <laughs> it would. That is about to become my ringtone. So that moving forward brings us to paranoid personality. Um, this is a solid performance. Uh, of course, I, I liked uh, Chuck Garrick's backing vocals. That was something when we discussed the studio version, we were looking forward to hearing. I don't think they're loud enough in the mix, though. Uh, whether it's a miking issue or a mixing issue, I'm not sure. I would have liked to hear him a little louder in the mix. And my only other note on this, which we kind of already touched on, is with Paranormal in the title, why are we only getting one Paranormal song? Yeah, I'm with you on that. So if you're going to pick another one off of Paranormal, do you have a... I would have sure. loved to see Rats on this. Yeah, that would have been pretty awesome. I don't know if I'd pick anything else ahead of that. And I know you're not as big a fan as I am but of it, but uh, Fallen fallen in Love, uh, and you can't get up. That could have been, I think, pretty powerful live as well, but it's also a little bit lighter on the lyrics. But And so I'm with you 100% that in the studio version, 
And Mike and I were absolutely convinced that it was Chuck because it sounded like Chuck when you got the parano, parano going. We were waiting to really hear Chuck do it because this is right. It's wheelhouse stuff for Chuck. And I can call him Chuck because I've seen Bisto Blanco and I was close enough that I could have could have poked Chuck in the eye. So it was awesome. Another threat against Chuck. (laughs) (laughs) Racist, (laughs) necrophiliac, meth addict who has strange fantasies about Jesus. Kelly Toole. I did. I did have to actually break eye contact with Calico Cooper on a couple occasions because it became uncomfortable. Because they were so darn. It was awesome. It was a great venue, a little small venue here in Illinois, and we were able to see Bisto Blanco. And by the way, folks, if you get a chance to see Bisto Blanco, do they're amazing, fantastic band, super fun. But I'm with you 100 percent that uh, you can tell Chuck's killing it. But you got to listen really hard because he's not mic'd up quite as well as it would. He should have really pulled that forward as well. And it's not as if Chuck doesn't project. So it had to do with the mix more than anything else. It was nice to hear it. Uh, I actually would have really liked, given the the number of tracks on this album, it would have been nice to have at least seen a second song off of Paranoid Personality. All right. And that brings us to Ballad of Dwight Fry, which is one of, I believe, two songs off the greatest Alice Cooper album. It happens to be on here. The second greatest Alice Cooper album had an entry earlier. Ballad is Away Five, of course, is a fan favorite. Uh, I think I speak for both of us when I say it's a song that we we both love. What really stood out to me, again, Chuck Garrett killing it on the backing vocals on this song. Great execution of it. It's always good to hear songs from the second greatest Alice Cooper album ever. The whole tail end of it with Alice doing the don't touch me thing is always really sweet. <laughs> it's kind of cool as well. Uh, this is a fantastic song live. Uh, band rocks it chuck chuck's awesome alice is awesome in it so fun listen okay next we get a little mashup of killer and i love the dead now what i liked about this is we get a little more necrophilia on this album which is always a good thing again just to bring up fistful of alice this this similar type of situation happened on fistful of alice where you got a pairing of a segment of Steven with the track welcome to my nightmare i feel like that was done a little bit better but again, that's it's almost not fair to compare it to Fistful of Alice because you guys already know Kelly and I love that album. So again, I wish Chuck had been mic'd a little better because this is he shines during um, Halo Flies and pulling folks through there, but then uh, they turn uh, you know turn it over to to him to sing the lyrics of "I Love the Dead" and uh, his delivery is amazing i'd I'd actually argue that chuck garrick delivery of i love the dead is as good if not superior to alice's so it's um that may be heresy but it's pretty great but when he's again he is just such a great stage presence when he's just like saying do you love the dead he's kind of pulling people in uh it is uh amazing so i wish he had been you know they had pulled him up in the mix a little bit more on there but you still get a pretty good sense of it and this whole comment, you know, it's always great to get kind of the killer uh, gallows intro music and and the and the love of the dead stuff. So good addition, loved it. It's fun. Just wish they had kind of you know t- turned Chuck up just a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's one of my main quibbles with this album is he needed to be a little higher in the mix. And again, if you guys can't tell, not only are we huge Alice Cooper fans, obviously we're both big Chuck Eric fans as well. Yeah, and so that may be another, uh, we may need to be start talking about some of the Bisto Blanco albums at some point. Yeah, definitely. I think that would be a lot of fun to do. Before then, though, let's get this thing finished since Kelly's wasting a lot of time. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. All right, so that brings us to the second song off the greatest Alice Cooper album of all time, 18. We've discussed this before. In my opinion, I'm 18 as huge, popular, anthemic a song as it is, is actually the weakest song off of that album. And I've just heard it so much. It's not my favorite Alice Cooper song. I definitely get the appeal of it, and this is a fine performance of it. It's just not my favorite song. So this slot should have been filled with For Veronica's Sake. (laughs) <laughs> so, how great yeah. would that have been? been. Zoro's Ascent and for, for, for yeah. Zoro, yeah, actually, Zoro's Ascent would have been, which is magic, folks. Listen to Zoro's Ascent. It's magic. I'll probably put it in the blog post because I need to keep reminding people how awesome Zoro's Ascent is. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100%. And so, you know, much like, so Mike's, as I think we've established before, Mike is a huge sports guy. So, you know, in golf, which is Mike, Mike's a big golfer, you know, does it all the time. The objective is to eventually get the, you know, hit the ball, 
get it get it on the green, sink your putt, all that kind of deal. I think this is illustrative uh, of that in that, you know, the second greatest album by Alice, I Love It to Death, you know, needed two swings, you know, to kind of get get things through, whereas the greatest album, Billy Dollar Babies, needed one, you know, swung the boat and it was just a great drive. But I'm I'm with you. This is it's a good song. It just seems like there's an opportunity here to say we've heard this so much. There's so many other things that could have occupied this spot. Yeah, but I would have loved kind of, to hear like another deep cut song here. Yeah, that would have been Zorro's Ascent. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know we're at we're kind of at encore time, so you probably do need to trot out something that everybody is like super familiar with, and that would certainly be I'm 18. And I don't think you can really have an Alice Cooper concert where you don't have that in there somewhere because it's and it's always a good performance. Oh yeah, no, no, I t- and the thing is, like, I I totally get it. I get the appeal of the song. I know it's an incredibly popular song. I know it's something he'll he's expected to play. So I, I get it. It's just that you know we already got a couple of of cool deep cuts that you kind of weren't expecting on this. Would have been nice to see something else in going with our whole intro thing and audience and all that stuff. What do you think about them including in between this and the encore track the the audience chant again? So I mean that's where. Uh... I like the one after Cold Ethel the best, <laughs> but it is a little confusing to say, did he do two encores? What's going on from there? But I mean, you're at the tail end of a live album. You're about to go into Schools Out, which you know is how every Alice Cooper concert ends. So un- not unexpected. And I, I will listen to French people chant Alice all night long because <laughs> it's awesome. While having sex with a corpse on meth. So that heavy editing for this podcast. <laughs> That brings us to, as Kelly mentioned, the final track, School's Out. There is great audience participation on this. It includes a segment from Another Brick in the Wall, which is something that Alice has been doing. And it's nearly nine minutes in length, this version of School's Out, which I want to say is about a quarter of the length of the actual School's Out album. Yeah. (laughs) But, But, you know, you're getting the band intros. Uh, and that's always, that's always fun. And we mentioned, uh, this on some of our previous discussions that Tommy Hendrickson, uh, there's a, a habit that they've developed that what, whatever city they're in, whether it's Montrose, Cleveland, Bloomington, Illinois, <laughs> Peoria, Illinois, wherever they're at, when Alice gets to Tommy, he introduces Tommy as a native son of whatever city he's in. And he did that again tonight, you know, during this album, which is, and you're not going to believe this from Paris, France. Uh, and if you've ever heard Tommy speak, you will recognize he's not a native French person, which is racist. <laughs> no, <laughs> he's just he's heavily east uh, East Coast, New Jersey, New York influential when you hear him speak. Who are also wonderful people, much like the French, yes. wonderful people. <laughs> so, so what are your your final thoughts on this album, sir? So if you haven't heard Alice Live, this is a good choice. Mike and I have already established that there's a singular choice for like the absolute best exposure of that. But this this is a really fun album. There's some kind of special, unique moments in it. Some kind of deep cuts, as Mike has mentioned a couple times as well. Alice has been around a long time. And to roll out another live album, it's like, okay, so is it worth it? Is it, you know, another live album? Is it worth it? This one's worth it. It's it's a really good I as I kind of look at them fistful of Alice remains the top one without a doubt I I had a as a strong second live as Montrose I'm gonna have to keep thinking about it this one's a, you know it's very close if it doesn't re- replace it it's very very close and it's mostly because the set list here is is really outstanding a good diversity of things on that so I think this is this is a worthwhile purchase if you haven't uh, had a chance to hear Alice live. Um, I do think if you haven't heard them live and you buy this, you're going to enjoy it. And then you'll go buy Fistful of Alice and you'll understand why Mike and I are so crazy about that album. Absolutely. Fistful of Alice, I would say, is still the gold standard. But this, this is up there, though. We haven't actually ranked the live albums, but if we were, this would be definitely in the top half for me. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's top three. Um, and I just I'd have to keep I'd have to go back and listen to Live of Montrose a couple more times to sort out. Uh, this one kind of wins on volume because <laughs> I mean, it's it's bigger. It's got a lot. It's got a double album. And so it's got a lot more and some pretty cool choices. So it's good. All right. So we we have uh, nailed down uh, Alice's new release. 
the super exciting thing is my YouTube unmonetized YouTube channel. Thank you, Google. We're right on the cusp of over a hundred thousand views. We're about two thousand views away from the YouTube channel having a hundred thousand views in total. Nice. The exciting thing is a lot of times our Alice stuff does super well. So hopefully this is the guy that pushes us over the edge on that, which would be really cool. You're going to hear more from Mike and I soon. We'll probably do, we've had a user request from Mick to do Billion Dollar Babies Battle Axe. We'll do that. And I do think, to, to Mike's point, we've been been making noises about having a, just a overall best live album show. That may be coming up soon, too. And for you nurture and support fans, <laughs> wondering what the heck's going on with that. So Texas has banned the internet. <laughs> and so so we're unable to communicate with Mel anymore. Actually, she's, Mel is in kind of a interesting demilitarized zone between suburbs and industrial areas where her options for internet services have been limited and she's had a, a kind of a number a number of issues there so she continues to work to try and get that addressed and as soon as she gets kind of a reliable signal again uh, we'll start rolling in nurture and supports but unfortunately for you fans who are maybe maybe if you're a bigger nurture and support fan than squat cobbler have some bad news for you because <laughs> Probably for at least a little while longer, it's going to be Mike and I, uh, but uh, we're working hard to get Mel back in the mix. Well, do you want then for the supporters, do you want to do a recommendation episode? No, no, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> because because your recommendations scare me. And so I'd rather stay with music. But yeah, we could we could do a we can do a recommendation one and uh, uh, we can we can, we'll uh, offline. Mike and I will sort that out. But. Definitely from a music standpoint, you're going to get uh, Battle Axe. You're going to get some live albums, but we may come back with a recommendation show uh, here sometime soon as well. Let us know in the comments what you want us to do. We should drag this one out a little bit. I think it was too short. I disagree. (laughs) (laughs) I got to turn around and edit this bad boy. So we'll see what it's done. So on that note, I'm going to try and uh, stop dragging this out and say thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Alright, I'm gonna stop the broadcast.